as happens throughout the year, there's a continual um, fluctuation of numbers at the varying grade levels. At the high school, we have um, 989 students. At the middle school, there's 714 students. At Wentworth, um, staying stable at 734 or 630, sorry, 673. Um, at Blue Point Primary School, we have 193 students, same as last month. At Eight Corners, we're up three students at 227. And then at Pleasant Hill, we're up a student at 174. Um, at this time last year, our enrollment was at 2,990 students, so um, it's 20 students less than it was at this point last year, but we continue to monitor this and we're also using a couple of tools that um, were created for us by um, planning decisions and we'll talk more about this at our next workshop meeting when we're looking at our long range facilities plans um, for the district, but we're right on target for what the um, we actually did two projections with our enrollment. One was called the best fit enrollment and then another was adjusted for new housing improve improvements that were happening in town. And so we're really right on track with the projections for the new housing improvements which predicted that this school year we would be at 2,966 students and so we're just four students higher than that. Um, where the best fit model had us at like 2,903 students and we knew when we saw those numbers that that wasn't going to um, actually be the reality for us given all of the development and, and the progress that's happening in Scarborough. So little update just three, year, three months into the school year to give the folks at home um, and in our community a sense of what our enrollment's looking like this year. And then um, we also have one other report tonight. I've asked our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Monique Culbertson, to come and give us an update on the main educational assessment system. Um, so this is our standardized testing that occurs annually here in the Scarborough Public Schools and in other public schools across the country. But Monique is going to talk specifically about what's happening here in Maine and then um, give you a sense of how have we been progressing and how have our students been performing over time um, in transition through the various different types of um, assessments that have existed. So we do not yet have public um, current data that we can share with the public. Monique's going to speak to that as well. Um, but it's coming soon so we just wanted to make sure that everybody was ready to receive that information when it is made public. So I turn it over to Monique. and. Thank you for all the time that you've put into developing this presentation. You're welcome. Good evening. Uh, as uh, Superintendent Kuchenberger has shared, we wanted to pro provide you a little bit of context. Uh, I originally targeted the public release of the state data was scheduled for December 5th. I just found out yesterday afternoon due to some adjustments they needed to make on the reporting site, it's now set for December 7th. Uh, <clears throat> so that, and I'll describe the reasons why, um, actually, here in my technology going here. But I wanted to give you um, an idea of what, a little bit of a history about uh, what's been happening here and then also how we use the data moving forward. Uh, it is, it has been a changing landscape. This chart describes uh, for grade three through eight and also for grade 11, a little bit different. In the past, um, we uh, have had a test we refer to as the NECAP. They're all the main educational assessments. Uh, these different names under test name, main contracts with a vendor who produces the test for the state. And in the past, we had a number of years of NECAP, which is the New England uh, consortium um, and it, it moved from the MEA which Maine contracted independently for, we moved to the consortium to save some funds. That test, the NECAP test was always in October and that's important to note when we start looking at results because we're really talking about the year before. Uh, but those were based on the Maine learning results uh, and they covered reading and math grades three through eight every year, three, four, five, six, seven, eight students were tested. Uh, but for writing in grade five and eight and 11, uh, writing was assessed. Mm -hmm. But in 1415, in light of the Common Core and the adoption by the state of Maine of the Common Core, in, in we call those the learning results Common Core uh, now, um, the Smarter Balanced Assessment was used for one year only. 
and because of a legislative mandate we shifted from the smarter balance the legislative piece stated that we no longer wish to have the state no longer wish to have a relationship with the smarter balance with that consortium and so the test changed once again uh, it's now referred to as the empower me test it's still the MEA but we refer to it as the empower me a different vendor once again the timeline was quite tight the RFP for proposals didn't even go out until the fall of last year so for a te testing company to put together the testing pieces as well as the reporting site it was a tall order so we all worked together as a state to implement and do the best job we could um, at implementing this new assessment but it too is uh, based on the main learning results which are based on the common core one difference with the empower main was that reading and writing got merged into literacy what's called literacy so where we used to get three sets of scores now we're only getting um, three sets of scores reading writing and math and now we get a literacy score so that's <coughs> another reason why it makes it very difficult to compare grade 11 in the past it was called the main high school assessment but it was really the SAT and this is where the state contracted with the college board to make the SAT our state test and then they worked with the college board to set proficiency levels because that's how our state tests are reported but in the year of the Smarter Balance Consortium, because Maine was connected to the Smarter Balance um, Consortium, uh, it, the students did not take the SAT for the state test. They took this different test. And then many of our students also took the SAT. And that's where the pushback came in that year in terms of too much testing, particularly at the high school level. And then this past year, the state has gone back to contracting with the college board. Science, uh, for better or for worse, has stayed the same. It's been based on the main uh, learning results, uh, which are getting close to about 20 years old. There are new national standards, but the state has yet to adopt those new national standards. But the test, referred to as the MEA, um, assesses those uh, learning results in science. Uh, what I wanted to share with you is how we use the data. Uh, we analyze it by looking at trends over time in order to make big decisions. For individual student data as well as for group data, we always look at other data sets as well. We don't make huge decisions based on any one data set. We always try and look at multiple data sets to make good decisions. And we also want to ask lot ourselves lots of questions and find additional information to make sure that the conclusions that we're drawing are accurate. So we look at it by comparing with our state and our neighbors over time. We also track a grade level and we also track a group of students as well and I can I'm going to be showing you some charts and some graphs and how we do that. An important piece to keep in mind and this is an important chart to keep an eye on is we've made some significant investments in our schools over the years. New curriculum materials, we've done quite a bit of standards work, uh, we've had some redesigns at the middle school. Our students have entered into the Wentworth School, a new school. There is research that shows that facilities has an impact on student achievement. So I've included the new Wentworth School in one of our organizational shifts. And most recently, the high school has added that A East period, that academic enrichment and support, as well as advisory. So I've included those in our timeline uh, for Scarborough. I'm going to show you. Uh, quite a few slides with uh, lots of data we're not going to go through every piece of data here but I want to just give it to you as a highlight uh, what I've identified are the last four years of our kneecap data so it's older data it's a couple years old now I've only pulled out grades 5 8 and 11 uh, reading math and writing I've also included the state data and I've also included comparison schools instead of lots of schools We've identified these four school districts, two of which, if you recall, the CPAIR report um, provided during the last budget season last year. Uh, Falmouth and Yarmouth are considered aspirational districts as a result of their community profiles, uh, their investments, uh, <clears throat> and their enrollment. Uh, and yet, we've also, I've also included uh, RSU 21, which is Kennebunk, which is a comparable district, most closely aligns with Scarborough, and South Portland, which is not a comparable district to us. So we have those four. Uh, and we'll begin with taking a look at reading across the grade level. And if you can squint a little bit, 
uh, and in your paper copies, I tried to make this uh, charts large enough. Uh, if you can squint a little bit, you'll notice <clears throat> that our performance here, in, we have Scarborough, we have Maine, we have Falmouth, we have Kennebunk, South Portland, and Yarmouth. And you'll note four years of data, with the blue bar reflecting the oldest um, set of data, 2010-11. And so pretty quickly, you can take a look at any trends, four-year trends within our school district and compare those trends with other schools. You can also compare our performance and that trend to the state of Maine as well. Uh, and in reading, we historically have always uh, performed rather well, and I'll show you in comparison to writing. Uh, and particularly with, I always take a look at where Kennebunk is because they are a comparable district and how we perform uh, relative to Kennebunk. Uh, you'll note that after this year, the reason why the test state test change was because of more rigorous standards, the common core standards of the main learning results. And that was the whole reason for changing the assessment. <clears throat> so another piece that we look at, and this is the percentages of students who meet or exceed the state standard. Uh, the data that isn't displayed on the screen is the data that we spend the most time at. So while 84% of the students in 2010, oops, excuse me, wrong button. Uh, <clears throat> 84, well, they're 84% met or exceeded. That 16% of the student population who partially met or did not met, we spend an awful lot of time mining that data, identifying those students, and providing support for those students. So while we focus on our gains here, I want people to realize that we spend an awful lot of time going in, taking a look at those students, looking at other data sets, talking about the programming for those students to help support those students moving forward. So keep an eye on the 2010-11 as a fifth grader. In what year would they be an eighth grader? 13 here. 13, 14. The quiz. <laughs> Pardon? So if we look at the eighth grade data, what color bar would those kiddos have been as fifth graders? Blue as fifth grade. Be the yellow. Last one. Yellow, yellow. Fifth grade. yellow. So we can follow a cohort. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> we can follow a cohort of students. So that class in um, in 2010 <coughs> 11 of fifth graders, 84% met or exceeded. As eighth graders, it would be the yellow bar, and we are at 86%. So another way we look at the data, we organize it a little bit different to focus on, on cohort data, is we track a group of students over time to see if that changes, if we're really moving students along in increasing the numbers of students who meet or exceed. In the 11th grade, you'll notice across the board a bit of a drop. Because the SAT one is in the spring, but it's the SAT. It's an entirely different assessment. So you can notice um, that every, everyone's performance has dropped, but that may be a factor of the rigor of that assessment. It's also delivered in one day, as some of you may recall, in um, a three or four hour chunk of time, where the kneecap is delivered in smaller chunks an hour or two at a time over the course of several days. So we have to look at all of those when we start comparing our data. But looking at Scarborough's performance, again, I like to compare it to our comparable district, which, which would be Kennebunk, and in this case, we are pretty comparable there. Moving along, looking at writing, first thing you'll notice in grade five is great variability over time. Uh, this worries us, worried us at the time. And we also, in comparison to reading, didn't feel as if we were doing as good a job within writing, and that was one of the reasons why we decided when we implemented our new literacy curriculum, we went with writing first. <clears throat> and as we're collecting data over time, we do have the SBAC data, but the Empower data, as we track that over time, will also give us some indications of our gain as well. In grade eight, again, variability. And that variability, you'll notice, is reflected across the districts. 
You'll notice that in uh, the year 2011-12, uh, <clears throat> you'll notice that compared to 12-13, there was a significant drop. But you notice a drop across all the districts as well. So we take that into consideration when we start thinking about why our students performed had that drop um, as we move along. Uh, one of the issues uh, with uh, that year in the grade bar there for eighth grade, in that year we implemented new curriculum materials and provided some significant professional development in Springboard. Um, used that as a framework, it's, which is a college board product. Um, and you'll know at first blush it would look like an implementation dip. But when we take a look at the performance across all the districts and also notice a bit of a dip there, um, it makes you wonder. The other part of that is, again, a fall implementation also tells us that we really wouldn't start to see a change for another year or so. And in the <clears throat> grade 11 for writing, you'll notice that in our comparable district, Kennebunk, there was great variation, but we were rather consistent. And during that time, the ELA department at the high school was working on developing and having conversations around common expectations for writing and beginning to talk about developing um, common rubrics in their classrooms. So that whole steady line is not surprising, and that's consistent with other data that we've seen. In terms of mathematics, Important to note for mathematics, in the year 11-12, we implemented, that was the first year of our math and focus investment at K-5. Uh, and you'll note that it might seem like a bit of an, again, you wouldn't see any change in the orange line because the test was also implemented within a month of the new curriculum. Uh, so you see a slight dip in that second year, but in the third year, you see the data starting to move forward and starting to rebound. Likewise, at the middle school, the middle school went through an investment and professional development uh, during the year 2012-13, and again, you see a little bit of that dip, but when you look across the state and look across other districts, there was a bit of a dip except in Kennebunk, that was more or less steady. <clears throat> and also at the high school, grade 11 mathematics, we invested not only at the middle school, but we invested at the high school as well, and you can see a slight upward trend in the data uh, there. <clears throat> we did some PD, but we did not do as much PD as at the other level. So that's just a little snapshot of how we've been using and taking a look at the NECAP data. We had one year of the Smarter Balanced Assessment data. Uh, the data was limited. We couldn't do a whole lot of what we call data mining with that. Uh, and now that the interactive <laughs> report site is just no longer there, um, it makes it um, even more problematic. Uh, so there was only one year. The data was a challenge because there were a number of high schools to compare high schools. Um, in particular because a number of students opted out of taking the test. Um, in some of our area schools, particularly Yarmouth, they weren't even able to report results. There were so few students who took the assessment <coughs> in that year. The way in which the information came out publicly was by school. It wasn't even by grade level. So particularly, we have a number of school districts who have grades, um, schools with lots of different grade configurations, so we couldn't even compare apples to apples or grades to grades. So it's very limited in what we can do, and I also talked about how reading was combined into an ELA literacy. But what we can do is take a look at how Scarborough compared with Maine performance, particularly in, well, we can do that in math, but we can also take a look at ELA to see how the red line uh, denotes Scarborough performance across all the grades, grades three through 11. Uh, the blue line is the state, so we can take a look at that. You'll note a significant <coughs> dip in that sixth grade year in that year for ELA. You'll also notice it in math when we look at the math piece. Uh, one of the questions we started asking ourselves was why? What's going on there? 
interestingly enough, it is the sixth grade. This was after, this was the first year of their redesign. Um, the sixth grade is in the portable. So we started asking ourselves questions around, was it the technology? Was it the implementation of the assessment? Was it, what was it? So we started brainstorming lots of different ideas. And without trend data, we really can't tell. So we're just noting that. We've gathered some information around that. Uh, and so we're going to keep an eye on that. What we can do, though, is we can take a look at our kneecap average scores in math and how that compared to the state, and then look at the SBAC data, even though it's one year, and look at how that difference compares as well. So you'll note in that chart, if for grade five, when we take the average of our performance over time and find the difference, it's 13 points. When we look at that one year of uh, SBAC data, you'll notice that the difference, <coughs> oops, I highlighted the wrong column. The difference is 17 points compared to 13 points. So I would consider it a good thing that even though there were higher standards in that assessment, it was a more rigorous assessment, we were further from the state. Uh, than when we were taking the kneecap data. Uh, likewise, in eighth grade, uh, the difference was 17 percentage points, and the difference with the SBAC was 24 points, and grade 11, 23 point difference. Those are all good things, which are indicators that where we invest, and we've invested heavily in mathematics over the years, where we invest, we see some gains and indicators of success or at least growth in those areas. We won't be happy until 100% of our students meet or exceed. So in conclusion, uh, the scheduled release at this point in time, I did a quick scan of my email, and at this point in time, it's still <laughs> scheduled for December 7th. Um, we're still going through and reviewing the data that is online. Uh, we will, our plan is to post data. Once it's public, we'll post our own data and our own little bit of context and summary, a little press release. Uh, but I would like to remind you and the public that we're going to consider this baseline data. We'll continue to compare over time, similar to how we've done in the NECAP. Uh, we're going to look at group data. We're going to look at individual data. Hopefully in years moving forward, the data will come back to us sooner. They won't be building the system. Mm -hmm as they're moving along, and we'll be able to um, be a little bit more efficient with some decisions. Uh, but we like to have three years of trend data before making decisions. And again, a reminder, with additional data sets, other data um, to look at. Uh, and we do a lot of observation pieces and ask lots and lots of questions to gather additional information before making big decisions, before we invest. Questions? Do you have a sense of the opt-out rate for these standardized tests? And if so, if there's any sort of demographic generalities that can be drawn from the students who do opt-out? Uh, no, I don't know that there were. We had very few opt-out here at the high school. Uh, we missed the 95 participation rate by maybe a couple of percentage points. Uh, so it really, in terms of our data and validity, it really didn't impact that. But I think I was looking at across other districts, and it ranged anywhere from about 50% to 80%. And I really didn't take a close look at sort of the demographic areas. And you assume that that rate is probably the same for Wentworth and the middle school as well? No, not at all. The elementary schools across the state, um, there were much fewer opt-outs um, across the state as well as Wentworth and the middle school. Um for the science information that you were going over, it was the changing landscape of the MEA. Great question. Thank you. I forgot to mention that piece. Oh. Um, our data, our science data will also be released on December 7th, and then I can provide um, information if you'd like to see that, and that would be across the last five years. I just had a question. You had mentioned that there were new national standards for In the science, science mm -hmm. um, and that the state had yet to adopt the national standards. Do you happen to know if there's like an estimated year when we're going to adopt the science standards? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or uh, there is no <laughs> estimated date as no. to when those standards yeah. will be adopted. I figured not, but <laughs> I thought maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing has been released. All right. 
Donna? <clears throat> Couple of things, um, Monique. So <coughs> the Empower Maine is now what we ha we are called. That is our MEA test. Yes. Is Empower Maine, the name of the company or the name of? No, the, it's the eye testing. I tester platform, um, it, it's not the name of the company, it's the name of the test. It all okay. fits under the umbrella of main educational assessment. Mm -hmm. Other main educational assessments also include things like the um, ELL access testing, the alternative assessment portfolios for um, students who, um, uh, uh, special needs students who are unable to access this, the Empower Me test. So it's a whole range of assessments. The science is also MEA. We just call the science MEA science, but it, we refer to it as Empower Me is okay. the name of this. And uh, another thing is um, you had mentioned when we were looking at the grade five reading and ECAP comparison, the beginning of your presentation, you talked about students who are um, having difficulty and that you were providing some support to those students. I was just wondering, what, when during the day can they receive that help and who's providing that? Do we have the staff we need to in, in order to cover those supports? Is it a pull-out program or what? Sure. Um, and even though there are no state tests at the K-2, we also have our, and we have a, uh, an obligation, a mandated obligation, state mandated obligation to provide what's called universal screening assessments so that we can identify any students who are at risk of failure and to provide those supports as early as possible. So at the K-2 level, we have academic support staff folks um, as well, and at 3, 5, and 6, 8, and also at the high school, we have supports in place. When students access those at K-2, it's really on an uh, individual student basis in terms of when they might be able to go down to the academic support to receive those services. Sometimes, it depends on the student and their particular schedule. Sometimes they sneak it in, in and around. Um, the lunchtime is a bit of a break time. We don't, try to, we don't try to access students during recess time, which is very important time. It may come out of a special time. It may come out of uh, either science or social studies time. Mm. Uh, but we don't, at the elementary, have a special period or block in time mm -hmm. where there is um, time for students to go to get extra help. At 3-5, though, this year they have reworked the schedule a bit to be able to offer some of that time once a week where the whole school is involved in sort of almost like that high school model oh, okay. of enrichment. Mm -hmm. um, the difference at the high school is and the middle school also offers that through their rise period is that they have that over the course of several days during the week. Because of the rotating schedule, it's not every day every, throughout the week, right. um, but it's more than once a week at Wentworth. And that our ed techs are providing that? Uh, we have professional staff as well as ed techs providing right. that. Thank you. Thank you. How are you and our staff finding the ease of administering this new test? It was, uh, uh, this test as well as the Smarter Balance Assessment was completely online. In other words, they needed to use their computers to take right. the test. Science is still paper and pencil, SAT is still paper and pencil. Uh, so it was quite a steep learning curve for staff as well as students during that first um, Smarter Balance year of testing. This last year, that piece was much better, um, and the administration was a little bit easier. Uh, we run um, meetings with teachers to help them go through the manuals and go over um, the do's and the don'ts on how to administer. Uh, it, it, it takes time, and it takes time out of instruction and teacher planning time. Uh, but it is it's much better this past year than it was the year before. And how would you speculate it might have been had our children not had the access they have to the computer on a daily basis? Oh, it, it would have been much more mm -hmm. difficult. It would have interrupted much more instructional time, uh, just in terms of getting the students to the equipment versus the equipment being with the students. 
and there's also the factor of just being in the students, particularly at the elementary and the middle school, took these assessments in the comfort of their classrooms as opposed to going to a special location that was different. Uh, not necessarily less comfortable, but just a different environment. We used to at Wentworth when we were doing this, we used to take the library, eliminate all library instructional programming because we had to set up a computer lab there. Uh, so students kind of came in and um, used those computers in the library. And, and I would just add, not because I was here, but just knowing the transition from pencil paper to computer-based testing, that that time on device that our students are able to have because we have one-on-one -on -one device support in the district is critical, particularly when it comes to the ELA and um, having to generate you know, pieces of writing from start to finish on a device. So that having that familiar layer being familiar with the device is um, really important, but then also being knowing how to click and drag different things for the math is, is a, it's a whole separate skill set. Absolutely. It's the, the online tools that students can use, and it's also the ability to compose online. <coughs> and would you say it was easier for the students to adapt than the staff? Uh, it, uh, from what I see, it's easier for students than me. I can't speak for all staff. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> students are a lot quicker than I am. <laughs> They're right there, aren't they? They're wonderful. Absolutely. Jody? Um, thank you for putting this all together. It's fantastic, and I love all your charts. But I, I thought it was impressive and sort of exciting, and I wish we had more data to sort of mine out more years. But when you look at the math testing and you see that our new curriculum was implemented with the gray line, at 73, and then that next year it, it jumps up to 79, whereas the majority of the other districts is, were sort of going the other way. And so I just feel like that. Mm -hmm. I wish there were more lines to sort of check and see how that kept mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, um, and, and the data around um, in comparing the average kneecap to the SVAC I think is particularly notable in that uh, <clears throat> you know, the state, our performance grew from where the state was, even with more rigorous standards. Um, so that is really uh, impressive to me. And then I just had a quick question on the opt-out, and I don't know if I can get an answer here tonight, but my understanding is that if districts have a large number of opting out students, it affects your funding mm -hmm. from the state. And so how does Yarmouth, if they're not even able to produce results because they had so many people who opted out? It, it puts a district at risk of losing their funding okay. um, because there is a required, this is a, was a federal law, it is shifting, we now, that was the No Child Left Behind law, we're shifting next year, the year after, we're transitioning to Every Student Succeeds Act. There will still be 95% uh, participation expectation. Uh, there will still be annual assessments under that law. What that means in terms of accountability uh, and implications might shift, but the participation rate is still there, so it only put you at risk. So I had to provide documentation at around the conversations we, I had with parents of those students who um, chose not to participate in the assessment in order to show almost a due diligence that we were trying to educate our community on the importance of taking these assessments. Um, so uh, this last year, we made our participation rate, and I think going back to the SAT, a number <coughs> of other districts made their participation rate as well because the SAT has more value to juniors at the high school than this where this smarter balance thing came from, which doesn't impact my future at all. Um, so there's much more motivation with the SAT. And it's, it, it's almost an additional test, which now has been eliminated because yes. we've gone back to the SAT. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Give more superintendent report. That is all of my superintendent reporting. Um, I know we already talked about adjusting the agenda, but I'm going to rearrange the agenda to bump up <laughs> recognition. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do have uh, one recognition tonight, um, and I would like to recognize two of our high school students. 
Um, as everyone knows, we are a part of the, um, we are participating in a NEASC self-study this year. And so due to that, or because of that, superintendents in school districts um, who are affiliated with, with the NEASC um, work and with NESDEC, which is the New England School Development Council, are uh, awarded the opportunity to recognize two students um, in their district. Well, it depends on the number of students in your district. So because of our size of our high school, we are able to recognize two students um, who we think um, should be given this this honor of uh, national recognition of a um, academic growth and student leadership. And so what I did when I received this letter letting me know that we were able to select two students was talked with Principal Creech and um, talked about what it, what it means to be a student who um, is showing academic growth and what it means to be a student leader in learning. Um, at Scarborough High School and he worked really closely with the guidance counselors to think about all of our students and who would be most deserving of this honor. And so one of our students is able to be here tonight and I just wanted to publicly recognize him. I know um, I'm still learning about all of our students but I had a moment before the meeting started just to, to chat with William Taus and he was telling me that he's taking lots of AP classes. Mm -hmm. um, he's already thinking about college um, and he's been visiting colleges and has been accepted to Pitt, was it? Um, but has others on his dream, other dream schools on his list that he's still reaching for. Um, and also recently was recognized as a member of the All-State Jazz Band. Um, and so I'm so thankful that his parents were able to be here tonight and that he was able to come tonight just so that we could recognize him for his academic growth and leadership and learning. You have to walk the gauntlet. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, and now we want you to step back and get a picture of her. Congratulations. Then you can come back. He's blushing. Congratulations. Congratulations. So again, the, the uh, requirements for this recognition is that it is um, a high school student who has pursued high level of academic effort and who has also served as a positive role model for the entire student body. So congratulations, William. Thank you. you want to tell us who the other one is? Yes, I can. Our other um, recipient was not able to be here, but um, Sarah Yotter was our other student of recognition. All right. Congratulations. And that concludes my recognition for tonight. William and your, you, Mr. and Mrs. Tausch, are welcome to stay, but you certainly can leave as well. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Those Go AP study. classes keep you busy. <laughs> okay, so now moving on to 7.0, the chair's report. Um, basically, I will just give a quick update on Thanksgiving. Um, it was a community event. We were very fortunate to have the space of the Wentworth Cafeteria to host in. Um, and it was all covered by donations. It was 100% donation funded. Um, but I think it just is a good example of when Wentworth School was built, it was with the eye to community events. And what a fantastic venue for this. Besides the massive kitchen and people who know how to use it that were there volunteering their mm -hmm. time, um, just the layout of the cafeteria we were able to um, set up 50 tables. Actually, I think in the end we only set up 36 tables. But we actually were able to draw one of the curtains across um, and separate out 10 tables because we weren't sure if we would need them or not. And it made the room feel even smaller and a little fancier with the curtain drawn. And, um, it was just a really nice event with a lot of community members, a cross-section from infants to um, people in their 80s and 90s were there. I mean, it was amazing. There were 165 people there that ate. We had about 150 volunteers over two days. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it wasn't a school event, but a lot of school students were involved. We had 
you know, volunteers mm-hmm. running the gamut of age. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it would, it's really just what the vision was for that school. Without a community center, this is the best we could hope for, is to design Wentworth in a way that would allow these events to happen. And it was, you know, it's obviously not the first event that's happened there, but I think it was just a fantastic um, event that happened because we had the space that there really wasn't another place, even the high school cafeteria would not have worked as well. So um, great job, Wentworth okay. Architects, just like because that was great. Several people who mentioned um, at the end how nice it was because they were going to eat alone or with mm-hmm. their spouse, the two of them, instead they came to the community dinner and sat at a table with other people and really had an enjoyable meal. So that was very heartwarming to know that people took advantage of that and um, were not alone. Mm-hmm. For yeah, it was it was really um, just a really cool day. It really was. I think it would be nice to note that, that two former board members uh, donated uh, the Bob, Mitch, Bob Mitchell and his family and Chris Chiazzo and his family, and uh, they were able to pay the second half of the donation that was made by the Carter family and the One Step Party Shop who had donated all of the linens and the china and the flatware. And uh, we, a couple of former school board people picked up the, the rest of it. Mm-hmm. Very proud, very pleased. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very cool. Um, and then um, also I just want to point out that our next meeting, our workshop meeting on December 15th has been uh, moved to Wentworth. This is our annual meeting with the uh, local legislat- le- legislators. Um, and typically has a bigger audience and more people sitting at the table. So we only have half of the chambers that week. So we're moving the meeting to Wentworth. Um, it's also will be an update from um, Dan Cecil and Long Range Planning. So um, two two good items on the workshop. Um, but you know, it's, a mu- it's a must watch. It is <laughs> really really. <laughs> Set up your DVRs if you're not going to be able to make it. It's going to be a good one. Um, and definitely we'll be referring back to those throughout the year, so. Absolutely. And also, I will just mention, I don't know if I'm stealing Student Thunder, but there's some concerts coming up. You can go ahead. You can tell my phone. Okay, okay. I, just want, I should have <laughs> checked with you in advance, but um, just before our next meeting, I want to point out that there are two concerts. The high school band concert is December 7th at 7 p.m., and December 15th, the same night as this, so you'll have to choose, is the combined <laughs> high school chorus and band holiday concert. Um, at 7 p.m. as well. So that is it for my chair report. Um, and moving on to 8.0, the committee reports. And start down finance. Sure. Finance um, was originally scheduled to meet tonight, but we didn't have a lot to talk about. We're still waiting for the town council to um, pull together their committees and elect um, the chair and all of that. So once that happens, Next Wednesday for them, they'll now be on an alternating schedule with us. Usually it's the same week, but <clears throat> today's first. So once that happens, I'll reach out to the finance chair of the town council and try to start coordinating um, our joint meetings because I think the budget calendar is coming right up and we need to <laughs> sort of get working on that soon. Thank you. Um, Donna, do you want to say anything about policy? I know we have the list coming up, but. Um, no, not in particular <coughs> about policy, but Joanne and I did attend the uh, regional um, vocational schools meeting. And uh, I can't say there's anything in particular pertaining to Scarborough that came up there. Um, there were some busing discussions, and uh, I don't remember that. Do you have the, the date of the next meeting? It's January. Um, it's I think in January. It's January 19th. 19th. My birthday. Yeah. How I remember? Jody's going to go, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, communications. Carrie, do you have any? Um, not too much to report. We did meet with Julie on Tuesday afternoon. Um, we're continuing to discuss, as we've um, mentioned before, uh, ways that communications <coughs> can help start to um, help out the nutrition program, which is a perennial. Um, ends up being a budget issue with having to shift some finances around to help cover the nutrition program. So we're just continuing to brainstorm how communications, how we can um, 
inform the public and uh, the parents about all the great things going on in our program and try to start to close that gap. Christine, did you have a long range planning update or you say that all? Other than uh, Dan Cecil will be giving his report out December 15th. No. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jackie, negotiations? Uh, yes. We, we have had the notice from the uh, Scarborough Education Association that they would like to start negotiating for the bus drivers. And we met this evening to uh, start to plan for that. We don't have a report for the board as yet. We'll have to meet a couple of other times. And then the Maine School Boards Association uh, Legislative Committee met and uh, concerning the new uh, certification rules. And they really are a mess, quite frankly, if you've had an opportunity to look at them. And Maine School Boards is recommending uh, that any action be postponed for a year and that more people become involved <coughs> setting those standards for certification because if you read the whole thing, you wouldn't know what the heck was going on with the certification, quite frankly. And it covers all areas of, of teacher certification. So uh, we have submitted testimony, and I will let you know uh, what the subcommittee for the main for uh, the education committee will do, it'll go to the legislature, if, you know, and there will then be a public hearing. But uh, I can tell you, as a former educator and as a school board person, it would if those regulations are passed as is, uh, everybody will be confused. Kelly, I have one one oh, more yep. that I wanted to mention as well is that I attended the business and school partnership meeting. And this is a new group that, that has kind of evolved out of an older group. And it was really uh, quite impressive in terms of the number of people. I think we had about 20 people at that event. And uh, Monique, as well as Karen Martin from SEDCO, kind of heading up that group. And I'd say overall, wh what we're looking at is not so much um, events that are just single events where we say, okay, this is where our kids are going to learn what careers they might consider. Instead, it would be taking a look at how can we embed the concept of looking at careers over the lifetime of our K-12 students. So um, it's, it, I'm sure it will be exciting and interesting work, to, especially to see this evolve into something much more intense and continual. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the um, 9.0 student representative report. I'll go first. Um, so for the middle school this week, um, so Scarborough Middle School Student Leadership Council uh, sponsored the Stuff the Bus food drive for Preble Street. Um, and with the help of parents in the community, the drive was a huge success. Uh, the middle school alone stuffed practically the entire bus and had over 2,500 items collected to help uh, Preble Street through the holiday season. The student council students set a goal of 1,000 items, so they earned a pajama day on December 12th. I'm super jealous. <laughs> um, and Mrs. Rand's seventh grade homeroom won the Golden Soup Can Award for donating the most items. The sixth grade inquiry teams uh, went on a field trip to the Boston Museum of Science this week. So the displays at the museum were aligned with the students' work um, in the Can't Believe My Eyes unit, which was all about light. So uh, they were able to make the connection between what they were learning at school and what they learned at the museum. Again, super jealous. I wish I got to go to the Science Museum. Um, and so all students are going to be participating in a day of code on December 21st. So in addition to their work with coding, the, there are groups of students uh, who are challenged together to challenge to work collaboratively to develop a new app. That's very cool. <laughs> um, for high school report, like Mrs. Murphy mentioned earlier, there is a holiday course and band concert Thursday the 15th at 7 p.m. Um, there's also the Senior Citizens Holiday Concert, which is December 22nd at 10 a.m. Uh, winter sports have begun, so good luck to all of our winter athletes. 
and good on you for being able to do physical activity when it gets dark at 5 p.m. That's really <laughs> impressive. Um, and congratulations to all the seniors who have already been accepted and committed to their respective universities. And good <coughs> luck to all of you who are still in the process of applying. There we go. That's all I got. So for the Wentworth report, um, Wentworth also contributed to the Stuff the, Br the Bus program, and it was also very successful there. They are also um, <coughs> working on the Coats for Kids program. Coats as well as snow pants, hats, and match matching gloves and mittens will be donated to children in need. And uh, the PTA-sponsored Family Literacy Night, Treasure Your Time with Books, in cooperation with the Scholastic, uh, Scholastic Book Fair, was an enormous success. Um, I would also have a report on the primary schools, but I couldn't get any information. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, students. And we are now moving on to new business. So 11.1, .1, school board committee assignments. So um, we are all the same people that were here the last <laughs> year. So there has not been a bunch of change, but I'll read through the um, committee assignments just for the record. Um, negotiations will still be chaired by Jackie Perry and Christine Massengill and Kelly Murphy will also sit on negotiations. Policy, um, Donna Beely will be the chair, joined by Kate Miles and Kelly Murphy. Communications, Carrie Lyford will be the chair. Um, Jody Shea and Kate Miles will join her. Finance will be chaired by Jody Shea. Carrie Lyford and Christine Massengill will join on finance. Um, health and safety, I will stay um, the liaison for that. Long range planning uh, will be Christine Massengill. Vocational schools, we're going to do a tag team on that one because that's a big commitment in the middle of a work day for us to all for one person to commit to those meetings. So we're hopefully um, going to take some turns with those remaining meetings for the year. Um, Jackie Perry will stay our liaison for the legislature. And Donna will stay our um, business and school partnership liaison. And for um, advisory to the board for changing start times and school calendar, um, that has been Carrie and myself, but anyone can join us at any time for that, and we hope that we'll have an update sometime soon about that. Um, and I think that covers it. Were there any liaison positions that I left off the list? I think that I think that's the complete list. So did we have like an advisor for the uh, school calendar, or that was we, the one? We Carrie did. and Car Carrie okay. and I have done it before the calendar and Stay the school one. start times. Okay, but I feel like anyone could jump in on that if they wanted to. Um, and that's it for the um, committee assignments. So now moving to 11.2, K2 lead teacher appointment. Um, various K2 school staff have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded from the general fund. The recommendation is to appoint the K2 lead teacher positions as presented in agenda item 11.2. Do we have a motion? So moved. A move approval as printed. Second. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I know that uh, Mrs. Sizemore is aware that the, there are two different positions at each school. So would you tell for the public, please, the difference between the two positions at each school? Yes. Um, the K-2 uh, principals and um, lead teachers had met and uh, talked about roles and responsibilities at the school and what the needs were for uh, the school mm -hmm. and decided that it would best serve the school if they um, took the stipend allotted mo money in the contract and, uh, and split it so that um, there's a building lead who does more of the management pieces during the day uh, working in the school and then there is a curriculum learning lead they call it and that person does more of the curriculum work for the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to 11.3, first reading of policy IHBAA, referral and general education interventions. Take it away, Donna. 
So um, basically, as you know, we make changes on our policies based on what we learn, particularly from our law offices at Drummond and Woodsum. And in this particular one, all it was is changing the title and then indicating the references and the cross-reference. So that's all you have to know about this one. <laughs> Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions? Okay. All in favor? Seven plus two. Eleven point four, first reading of policy IHBAA dash R, referral procedures and general education interventions. So in this one it was just the title again, and if you look on page four, then you will see some changes where a paragraph has been added and a paragraph deleted, and then the cross referencing. Uh, move approval is printed. Second. I, I just Second. want to point out that, uh, as Donna <coughs> said, these are minor changes here. And I can tell you that there was great debate when we first brought these forward for policies. Mm -hmm. And they were really vetted by members of the board and the public. Mm -hmm. I just had a typo. I think, um, and it wasn't one of the changes, so it's probably been just pushed down the line a while, but the first sentence says, um, Scarborough Public Schools will refer the IEP team all school-age students suspected of having. I think we need to in insert a two. So it should say, the Scarborough Public Schools will refer to the IEP team all school-age students suspected of having a disability that requires special education and related services. I okay. Anyone else? Thank you. Have anything else? I thought about it and then I said no. <laughs> 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 Thanks, so okay. I'll have an amendment to. I no, move that we to amend the first paragraph to include two, the word two, two after refer. Right. Okay. Let's just vote on second. the second. Yes. Vote on the amendment. Everyone? Okay. <coughs> Seven plus two. And now back to the original motion as amended. Jackie. So I'm, I'm voting. You're voting? I'll keep <laughs> Are we all ready to vote on one? Okay. Seven plus two. Thank you. On to 11.5, first reading of policy ACAA, harassment and sexual harassment of students. So this one is basically um, looking at some definitions that they're asking that school departments uh, clarify the term sexual orientation. So there it is for you, and just the uh, legal references again to the American Disabilities Act. And that's about it. Okay. Move approval as presented. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you. Moving on to I'll, um, Right. Oh, 11.6, first reading of policy ACAAR, student discrimination and harassment complaint procedure. And we don't have any changes here. We're just looking um, to the fact that we did review this policy and it is in compliance. That's okay. it. Move approval as presented. Second. Any comments or questions? Okay, all in favor? Seven plus two, thank you. 11.7, first reading of policy IHBAC, child find. So on this one, you can see that we're at, uh, a paragraph is being added there and basically speaks to the expediency to which the school department acts in terms of finding students that are in need of whatever kind of services they may need So when they enter the school system, whether it's mid-year or whenever. Move, Move approval approved. is printed. Second. <coughs> oh, you're ready to vote. I'm okay. ready. Does anyone have any questions or comments? <laughs> <laughs> this one? I'm in favor. Oh. <laughs> all right. Well, then, all in favor? Thank you. Seven plus two. 11.8, first reading of policy, JKAA, use of physical <coughs> restraint and seclusion. Move approval. Oh, actually. It's up yeah. Yeah. Either way. I know that there's not much. Mm -hmm. So basically this one is adding two, two, two small uh, sentences, the first paragraph, basically being very specific about what a physical restraint does or does not cover. 
So again, it's, it's more of a definition. <clears throat> okay. Move approval as presented. Second. Any questions or comments about this one? Jackie? As a teacher, I once had to physically restrain a student who was absolutely out of control. And I had to sit there for a couple of hours until the social worker showed up. First day of school, quite frankly. And I had been trained on how to do that without giving it, you know, without hurting a child. But there's a piece in here that says that you have to make up your mind whether or not a child is going to harm themselves or others. And maybe it's more in the regulation than in the... Mm -hmm. But that's a split-second decision for whomever is with that child at that time. And I just happen to feel on a personal note that it's too restrictive for a teacher or an aide or a principal, whomever it might happen to be, uh, who has to do some physical restraint uh, on a child. And I just would like to know how everybody else feels about that. And uh, from Allison and the superintendent, how we could modify it to make it easier, if you will, or more palatable for a staff person. Um, we are fortunate that Allison Marchese, Director of Special Services, is an audience member. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Step right up. <laughs> you can give us some background on, on the seclusion <clears throat> and restraint. And we've had this discussion before, by the way. Mm -hmm. So if I'm understanding correctly, um, I, I actually think it should be this restrictive because it is our duty to keep the, all students safe. And the last resort is actually a physical restraint. Mm -hmm. The training the staff receive, and um, some staff are specialized training through a program called Safety Care. It is all about other ways to de-escalate before you put hands on. So um, I think for the protection of students, it should be a tight policy. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment? Jody? I just wanted to reiterate that these are, are minor changes to these policies. I think when we say them out loud and no one has the documents to refer to at home, it sounds mm -hmm. big and scary. Um, but it is just defining what a physical escort is <coughs> with students to help them redirect them from whatever it is that's happening to a safe spot, to down the hallway, back to their classroom, something along those lines. It's not a major discussion here. It's just absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. a small redirection. Correct. And then the other one is um, allowing a teacher to to break up a to fight. To break up a fight. Correct. <laughs> um, so those are the two things that we're seeing on our papers just for the people at home. I didn't want it to seem so big and scary not knowing what we're mm -hmm. looking at. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just add that we have started this year um, posting, Kelly Johnson has been posting all of the supporting documents on the website in addition to the agenda so that at, at tomorrow, by tomorrow, usually she does it really quickly, um, anyone at home could come back and reference these policies as you're seeing them. Perfect. Did anybody else want to comment on Jackie's concern? Donna? Oh, um, ju and just a little bit to respond to your comments, Jackie, is I think over the years what we've seen is um, an evolution of, you know, ways in which we can try to redirect students without touching them. And um, a big piece of this is the amount of recording that occurs as a result of a single incident, which takes up a considerable amount of time for our staff. Because every 
minute to minute is, is, has to be recorded as to what actually took place in the opinion of the staff who are handling that incident. You know, and, and I'm sure there must be law cases that play into why we end up having, you know, the, the changes to the law that occurs. But um, it, 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 average people do not understand what it takes to handle some of these situations in our schools. It's just really, uh, it, it's compliment to our staff. It's reasons why teachers leave, because it can be really difficult to handle these situations. And those who step up to the special ed positions, we're just so fortunate to have people that want to do this work. Not only our, our teachers, but our ed techs as well, who are willing to um, you know, work with kids that are truly in great need that years ago would not have been in our regular school. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put someone on the spot, but um, Carrie, you've taken safety care? I have. Yeah. Do you want to comment on <laughs> this at all? Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree that it should be a restrictive policy. Absolutely, a restraint should be the last option. You don't want to go there. The, the kids don't want you to go there. Nobody wants to go there. Um, and. Uh, my the one thing when I have done my safety care training that comes up that always eh, like <laughs> is hard for me to hear the safety care instructor always tells a story about a student alone in a computer lab pushing computers off desks not in Scarborough but um, this was like at a regional training um, and the teachers just had to stand there and watch it happen because they weren't mm -hmm. causing imminent harm to themselves or to any other students. And as a school board member, knowing that how much each of those computers cost, <laughs> that's, that's a painful story to hear. Um, but that's the way that the law is now, and that's, you know, it's, it's kids are our priority, not computers and equipment, so. Thanks. All right, are we ready? All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you. Then 11.9 is the first reading of policy JKAA-R, Procedures on Physical Restraint and Seclusion. <coughs> and so you can see on, on this particular one, on almost every single page, it's the removal of the word imminent is, is, the, is the action that's taking place, imminent risk to injury for the child. So it's been the removal of that word. Move approval. Second. Any comments or questions about the R? Okay, all in favor? Seven plus two. Right, so that takes us to 11.10, um, high school choral director. Uh, Patrick Volker has been nominated to fill this position created by a resignation. Mr. Volker, Mr. Volker received his bachelor's degree in music education from Vandercook College of Music in Chicago. He's been a choir director, music teacher, and piano teacher in different high schools in, in the Chicago area for five years. Mr. Volker, Volker will be placed on step six of the bachelor scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Patrick Volker as the high school choral director. Is a motion? Move approval. Second. All in favor? Discussion. Oh, do you want to have discussion yes. about this? Or not? Mm -hmm. Donna, mm -hmm. take it away. I was just wondering, um, is this a full-time position? It is a full-time position. Okay. And we're putting him to the test. He's already attended two arts council meetings and um, we'll have a performance coming up soon. So is it just high school? Just high, high school. school. Right? Okay. Similar to the band director, correct? Yep. Yeah. yeah. I'm just Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it a choral teacher or a choral director? I think at this point it is the choral teaching position that we are. 
then directing the choir as part of the teaching position that he has, right? No, I think there's a choral teacher. On that. Yeah. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay. That's why I was I'm questioning sorry that. Right. Big shoes to fill. Okay. So, so we need to amend this to say. Amend it to a choral <laughs> teacher. Teacher. Okay. 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 <coughs> Do we need to make an official amendment on that one? Since the director position would be a stipended position? I move that we change the title to high school choral teacher. Second. All in favor of the amendment? Seven plus two? Yeah. And now, Go back. are we done with discussion on that one? Mm -hmm. Okay, so all in favor of the amended title? Thank you. Seven plus two. Brings us to 12.0. We have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you.